Book two, chapter two, part two of History of the Inquisition of Spain, volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 1, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 2, Chapter 2, Super Eminence. Part 2. The persistence with which the Inquisition maintained any claim once advanced is illustrated by its endeavor to introduce a change in the ritual of the Mass favorable to its assumption of superiority it was the custom that the celebrant should make a bow to the bishop if present and in his absence to the eucharist in 1635 at valladolid the inquisitors required that when the edict of faith was read the bow should be made to them and on the refusal of the officiating canon they arrested him and the dean who upheld him and held them under heavy bail this aroused the whole city and brought a rebuke from the king who ordered them to discharge the bail and not to abuse their jurisdiction unabashed by this the effort was made again at compostela in sixteen thirty nine and duly resisted the king was again obliged to examine the question and after consultation with learned men decided that the chapter was in the right and that the inquisitors had the alternative of absenting themselves from the reading two rebuffs such as this should have sufficed but in sixteen forty three after careful preparation another attempt was made at cordova which produced a fearful scandal neither side would yield the services were interrupted the inquisitors endeavored to excommunicate the canons but the latter raised such a din with howls and cries the thunder of the organ the clangor of bells and breaking up the seats in the choir that the fulmination could not be heard even the inquisitors shrank from the storm and left the church amid hisses with their caps pulled down to their eyes but they lost no time in commencing a prosecution of the canons who appealed to the king in a portentous document covering two hundred and fifty-six folio pages philip and his advisers at the moment had ample occupation what with the dismissal of olivares the evil tidings from rosroy and the rebellions of catalonia and portugal but they had to turn aside to settle this portentous quarrel a royal letter of june sixteenth sixteen forty three ordered the inquisitors to restore to the canons certain properties which they had seized and to remove the excommunications while reference to similar decisions at compostela granada and cartagena shows how obstinate and repeated had been the effort of the holy office notwithstanding this the tribunal of cordova refused obedience to the royal mandate and a second letter of september the twenty eighth from saragossa where philip was directing the campaign against catalonia was required this was couched in peremptory terms the excommunications must be removed and for the future the roman ceremonial must be observed prescribing that in the absence of the bishop the reverence must be made to the sacrament while thus steadily endeavoring to encroach on the rights of others the inquisition was supersensitive as to anything that might be reckoned as an attempt by other bodies to assert superiority and it vindicated what it held to be its rights with customary violence when the funeral solemnities of queen anna of austria were celebrated in seville in 1580 a bitter quarrel about precedence in seats arose between the tribunal the royal audiencia or high court and the city authorities when the former arbitrarily suspended the obsequies until consultation could be had with philip the second then in lisbon engaged in the absorption of portugal he regulated the position which each of the contending parties should occupy and the postponed honors were duly rendered matters remained quiescent until a similar function became necessary 
after the death of Philip in 1598. The city spent weeks in costly preparations, and the catafalque erected in the cathedral was regarded as worthy of that magnificent building. November the 29th was fixed for the ceremonies, on the vigil, the regent, or presidential judge of the audiencia, sent a chair from his house to the place assigned to him, but the chapter protested so vigorously against the innovation that he was obliged to remove it. The following morning, when the various bodies entered the church at half-past nine, the benches assigned to the judges and their wives were seen to be draped in mourning. This was at once regarded as an effort on their part to establish pre-eminence and excited great indignation. The services commenced, and during the mass the inquisitors sent word to the cabildo, or city magistracy, that it should order the mourning removed. After some demur, the cabildo sent its procurator mayor, Pedro de Escobar, with a notary and some alguaziles to the audiencia, bearing a message to the effect that if the drapery were not removed, the inquisitors and the church authorities were agreed that the ceremonies should be suspended. He was told not to approach, and on persisting, he and his followers were arrested and thrown into the public jail. The inquisitors then sent their secretary with a message, but he too was kept at a distance, when he mounted the steps of the catafalque, and cried out that the tribunal excommunicated the three judges, Vallejo, Lorenzana, and Guerra, if they did not depart. A second time he came with a message, which he was not allowed to deliver, and again he mounted the steps to declare all the judges excommunicated, and that they must leave the church in order that the services might proceed, for the presence of excommunicates was a bar to all public worship. This was repeated again by the fiscal, when the audiencia drew up a paper declaring the acts of the tribunal to be null and void, and ordering it to remove the censure under pain of forfeiting citizenship and temporalities. But the scrivener sent to serve it was refused a hearing, and on his persisting was threatened with a pillory. The alcade of the city endeavored to calm the inquisitors, but Inquisitor Zapata replied furiously that if St. Paul came from heaven and ordered them to do otherwise, they would refuse if it cost them their souls. Meanwhile, there were similar trouble and complications among the church authorities. The vicar general, Pedro Ramirez de Leon, ordered the services resumed under pain for the dean and officiating priest of excommunication and of a thousand ducats. The precentor and canons appealed to the Pope, but the vicar general published them in the choir as excommunicates. The celebrant, Dr. Negron, was sought for, but he had prudently disappeared in the confusion and could not be found. It was now half past twelve, and the canons sent word to the audiencia that they were going and it could go. To leave the church, however, would seem like an admission by the judges that they were excommunicate and they grimly kept their seats. The cabildo of the city and the tribunal were not to be outdone, and the three hostile groups sat glaring at each other until four o'clock, when the absurdity of the situation grew too strong, and they silently departed. Meanwhile, the candles had been burning until five hundred ducats worth of wax was uselessly consumed. So complicated a quarrel could, of course, only be straightened out by the king, to whom all parties promptly appealed. The judges proved that they had not draped their benches as a sign of preeminence, but had proposed that the same be done by the cabildo and the tribunal. As far as regards the latter, the royal decision was manifested in two cedulas of December 22nd. One of these told the inquisitors that they had exceeded their jurisdiction in excommunicating the judges, whom they were to absolve ad cautelem, and they also had to pay for the wasted wax. The other ominously ordered the inquisitors Blanco and Zapata to appear at the court within fifteen days and not to depart without license. 
At the same time, on December 21st, the suspended obsequies were duly celebrated. It will be seen from these cases that the only appeal from inquisitorial aggression lay to the king, and that, even when the inquisitors were wholly in the wrong and the royal decision was against them, no steps were taken to keep them within bounds for the future. The altered position of the holy office under the Bourbons was therefore significantly indicated by a decision of Fernando VI in 1747. At the celebration in Granada, on September 11th, of his ascension, the Chancilleria, or Great High Court of New Castile, observed that the archbishop occupied a chair covered with taffety outside his window overlooking the plaza, and that the inquisitors had cushions on their window sills. It sent messengers to request the removal of these symbols of pre-eminence, and, on receiving a refusal in terms of scant respect, it stopped the second bullfight and put an end to the ceremonies. The matter was referred to the king, when the Suprema, in a memorial of solemn earnestness, argued that the Inquisition had for centuries been in the uncontested enjoyment of the privileges of which it was now sought to be deprived. It was the highest tribunal, not only in Spain, but in the world, as it had charge of the true religion, which is the foundation of all kingdoms and republics. The time had passed for this swelling self-assertion. Full discussion was devoted to the momentous question, and, on October the 3rd, Fernando issued a decree which proclaimed to Spain that the holy office was no longer what it had been. This was to the effect that, as the Chancilleria represented the royal jurisdiction, and thus indirectly the king himself, it was entitled to preeminence in all such celebrations and in those of the royal chapel. It was justified in its action, and thereafter no such signs of dignity as canopies, cushions, ceremonial chairs, and the like, should be used in its presence. In case of attempts to do so, one of the alcaldes del crimen, with his officers, should remove them and punish any workmen engaged in setting them up. The Inquisition and its members were protected in every way from subjection to local laws and regulations. An edict of Charles V in 1523 forbade all municipalities or other bodies from adopting statutes which should in any way curtail their privileges or be adverse to them, and, if any such should be attempted, he declared them in advance to be null and void. This, in fact, was only expressing and enforcing the canon laws enacted in the frenzied efforts to suppress heresy in the thirteenth century, and still in vigor. A constitution of Urbane IV, from 1261 to 1265, declares invalid the laws of any state or city which impede, directly or indirectly, the functions of the Inquisition, and the bishop or inquisitor is empowered to summon the ruler or magistrates to exhibit such statutes and compel him by censures to revoke or modify them. While this was designed to prevent the crippling of the Inquisition by hostile legislation, it inferred a superiority to law, and it was construed in the most liberal way, as was seen in a struggle in Valencia, which lasted for nearly two centuries. A police regulation for the improvement of the marketplace ordered the removal of all stands for the display of goods under the arcades of the houses. One house belonged to the tribunal. Its tenant was the worst offender, and he obstinately kept his stand and appealed to the tribunal for protection against the law. This protection was accorded with such vigor in 1603 that the saintly archbishop Juan de Ribera, who was also captain general, vainly endeavored to secure obedience to the law. Until the close of the 18th century, the tribunal thus successfully defied the real junta de policia, consisting of the captain general, the regent, and other high officials. At length, in 1783, Carlos III issued a royal declaration 
that no one should be exempt from obedience to orders of police and good government, and that all such cases should be adjudicated by the ordinary courts without admitting the competencias with which the Holy Office habitually sought to tire out those who ventured to withstand its aggressiveness. Under this, in 1791, the nuisance of Valencia was abated, when the tribunal apologized to the Suprema for yielding and excusing itself in virtue of the royal declaration of 1783. It had held out as long as it could, but times had changed, and even the Inquisition was forced to respect the law. Madrid had been earlier relieved from such annoyance, for a royal cedula of 1746, regulating the police system of the capital, has a clause evidently directed at the Inquisition, for it declares that no exemption, even the most privileged, shall avail in matters concerning the police, the adornment, and the cleanliness of the city. The lawlessness thus fostered degenerated into an arbitrary disregard for the rights of others, leading to a petty tyranny sometimes exercised in the most arbitrary and capricious manner. Inquisitor Santos of Saragossa was very friendly with the Licenciado Pedro de Sola, a beneficed priest of the cathedral, and Juan Sebastian, who were good musicians and who gathered some musical friends to sing complaints with them on Holy Saturday at Santa Engracia, where the inquisitors spent Holy Week in retreat. Santos used to send his coach for them and entertain them handsomely, but when, in 1624, he became Bishop of Solsona, although the singing continued, the coach and entertainment ceased, and the musicians went unwillingly. Finally, in 1637, some of them stopped going. The inquisitors sent for them and scolded them, which made them all indignant. Then, in 1638, the secretary Heredia was sent to order them to go, and when the chapel master excused them, with the intimation that they ought to be paid, Heredia told them the tribunal honored them sufficiently in calling for them. They did not go, and, when Easter was over, two of them, beneficed priests, were summoned, and, after being kept waiting for three hours, were imprisoned in a filthy little house occupied by soldiers, and were left for twelve hours without bedding, food, or drink. The next day, they managed to communicate with the chapter, but it was afraid to interfere, and, after six days of this confinement, they were brought before the tribunal and informed that they had the city for a prison under pain of a hundred ducats, and were made to swear to present themselves whenever summoned. As they went out, they saw two more brought in, the chapel master and a priest. At last, the chapter plucked up courage to address a memorial to the king through the Council of Aragon, which added the suggestion that he should order the Inquisitor-General to see to the release of the musicians and the prevention of such extortion. May 11th, Philip referred this to the Suprema, which, after a month's delay, replied, on June 14th, that, desiring to avoid controversy with the Church of Saragossa, it had ordered the tribunal to pay the musicians in future, to release any that were in prison, and to return whatever fines had been imposed. When petty tyranny such as this could be practiced, especially on the privileged class of priests, we can appreciate the terrorism surrounding the tribunals. Another distinction contributed to the supereminence claimed by the Inquisition, the inviolability which shielded all who were in its service. From an early period, the Church had sought to protect its members, whose profession was assumed to debar them from the use of arms, by investing them with a sanctity which should assure their safety in an age of violence. Throughout the Middle Ages, no canon was more frequently invoked than si quis suadente diabolo, which provided that whoever struck a cleric or monk incurred an anathema removable only by personal appearance before the Pope and accepting his sentence. More than this was asked for by the Inquisition, 
for the greater portion of the officials were laymen. They were no more exposed to injury or insult than those of the secular courts. But it was assumed that there was a peculiar hatred felt for them, and that their functions in defending the faith entitled them to special security. We shall see hereafter that the Inquisition obtained jurisdiction in all matters connected with its officials, but this, while enabling it to give them special protection, had the limitation that judgments of blood rendered ecclesiastics, pronouncing them irregular. In cases of heresy, this had long been evaded by a hypocritical plea for mercy, when delivering convicts to the secular arm for execution, but it was felt that some special faculties were requisite in dealing with cases of mere assault or homicide, and a motu proprio was procured from Leo X, January 28, 1515, empowering inquisitors to arrest anyone, even of the highest rank, whether lay or clerical, who strikes, beats, mutilates, or kills any minister or official of the Inquisition, and to deliver him to the secular arm for punishment, without incurring irregularity, even if it results in effusion of blood. The Holy Office thus held in its own hands the protection of all who served it. This was rendered still more efficient by subsequent papal action. Irritated at some resistance offered to the Roman Inquisition, Pius V published, April 1, 1569, the ferocious bull Si de Protogendis, under which anyone, of whatever rank, who should threaten, strike, or kill an officer or a witness, who should help a prisoner to escape or make way with any document, or should lend aid or counsel to such act, was to be delivered to the secular judge for punishment as a heretic, that is to say, for burning, including confiscation and the infamy of his children. Although this was intended for Italy, the Spanish Inquisition speedily assumed the benefit of it. It was sent out October 16th, and it was annually published in the vernacular on Holy Thursday. Thus, all concerned in the business of the Holy Office were hedged around with an inviolability accorded to no other class of the community. The inquisitors themselves were additionally protected against responsibility for their own maleficence by the received theory that scandal was more to be dreaded than crime, that there was inherent in their office such importance to religion that anything was better than what might bring that office into contempt. Francisco Peña, in treating of this, quotes the warnings of Aquinas as to cardinals and applies it to the punishment of inquisitors. If scandal has arisen, they may be punished. Otherwise, the danger to the reputation of the holy office is greater than that of impunity to the offender. The tenderness, in fact, with which they were treated, even when scandal had arisen, was a scandal in itself. Thus, when the reiterated complaints of Barcelona caused a visitation to be made there, in 1567, by de Soto Salazar, and his report confirmed the accusations, showing the three inquisitors to be corrupt, extortionate, and unjust, the only penalty imposed, in 1568, was merely suspension for three years from all office in the Inquisition. Even this was not enforced, at least with regard to one of them, Dr. Zurita, for we chanced to meet him as Inquisitor of Zaragoza in 1570. He does not seem to have reformed, for his transfer thence to Sardinia, the least desirable of the tribunals, can only have been in consequence of persistent misconduct. The tribunals naturally showed the same mercy to their subordinates, whose sole judges they were, and this retention in office of those whom unfitness was proved was not the least of the burdens with which the Inquisition afflicted Spain. What rendered this inviolability more aggravating 
was that it extended to the servants and slaves of all connected with the holy office. About 1540, a deputy corregidor of Murcia, for insulting a servant of the messenger of the tribunal, was exposed to the infamy of hearing mass as a penitent. In 1564, we find Dr. Zurita on circuit through his district, collecting evidence against Michael Bonnet of Palacio de Vicio, for canning a servant boy of Bene Modiguer, who held some office in the Inquisition. And the case was sent to Barcelona for trial, which shows that it was regarded as serious. So, in 1568, for quarreling with a servant of Miser Complada, who styled himself deputy of the abogado fiscal at Tarragona, the Barcelona tribunal, without verifying Complada's claims to office, threw into prison Geronimo Zapata and Antonio de Erguel, and condemned Zapata to a fine of thirty ducats and six months' exile, and Urgel to ten ducats and three months. In Murcia, Sebastian Gallego, the servant of an inquisitor, quarrelled with a butcher over some meat, when they exchanged insults. The secular judge arrested both, but the tribunal claimed them, prosecuted the butcher, and banished them from the town. The cases were of frequent occurrence, and it is easy to conceive how galling was the insolence of a despised class thus enabled to repay the contempt with which it was habitually treated. When the honor of slaves was thus vindicated, inquisitors were not apt to condone any failure, real or imaginary, in the respect which they held to be their due, and the offender was made to feel the awful authority which shrouded the tribunal and its judges. As their powers were largely discretional, with undefined limits, the manner in which they were exercised was sometimes eccentric. In 1569, for instance, the Jesuits of Palermo prepared for representation in their church a tragedy of St. Catherine, and, on October the 4th, they gave a private rehearsal to which were invited the viceroy and principal dignitaries. The inquisitor, Juan Bicerra, came as one of the guests, and finding the door closed, knocked repeatedly without announcing himself or demanding admittance. The janitor, thinking it to be some unauthorized person, paid no attention to the knocking, and Bicerra departed, highly incensed. When the Jesuits heard of it, the rector and principal fathers called on him to apologize, but, after keeping them waiting for some time, he refused to see them. The public representation was announced for October the 8th. The church was crowded with the nobility, awaiting the rising of the curtain, when a messenger from Bicerra notified the Jesuits that he forbade the performance, under pain of excommunication and other penalties at his discretion, until after the price should have been examined and approved by him. The audience was dismissed, and the next day the minister was sent to Bicerra, who submitted it to Dominican censors. Although they returned it with their approval, he discovered in it two objectionable points, so absurdly trifling as to show that he wanted merely to make a wanton exhibition of his power. The censors replied to his criticism, and he finally allowed the performance to proceed. We may not unreasonably assume that this may have been one of the freaks for which Bicerra was suspended in 1572, on the report made of him by the visitor Quintanilla. Then, with customary tenderness, he was employed in the responsible post of visitor at Barcelona, where he died soon afterwards. The sensitiveness to disrespect, and the terrorism which its arbitrary punishment diffused through the community, were well illustrated when, in 1617, Fray Diego Vinegas preached the Lenten sermons in the hospital of North Senora de la Garcia of Saragossa. He was a distinguished Benedictine, who had held high offices in his order, 
and his eloquence on this occasion brought in alms amounting to eight thousand crowns on january twenty first the inquisitors sent him a message to come to them the next day at two p m to which he replied in writing that he was indisposed and closely occupied with his sermons if they wished to order him to preach the edict of faith he held himself already charged to do so and begged them to excuse his coming a second message the same day told him to come at the same hour another day when he would be told what was wanted of him to which he answered that he would come but that if it was only to order him to preach the sermon he would return at once to castile without again mounting the pulpit whether anything underlay this somewhat mysterious action does not appear the significance of the affair lies in the fact that it at once became a matter of general public concern when that same night the governor of the hospital heard of it he recognized the injury that would accrue to the institution and to the whole city and forthwith reported it to the viceroy who commissioned the licenciate baltasar navarro to undo the mischief the result of his labors was that the inquisitors declared that as fray vinegas pleaded in disposition they would excuse him from preaching the edict of faith the affair appeared to be settled and vinegas begged permission to call on the two inquisitors santos and salcedo and pay them the easter compliments they graciously acceded and on easter monday he waited on them exculpated himself and begged their pardon for having been prevented by indisposition from preaching the edict all of which they accepted with great courtesy the community breathed freer for some vindication of the honor of the inquisition had been expected the inquisitors however had been consulting the suprema and vengeance was at hand the next day tuesday was the last of the series of sermons vinegas preached successfully to a crowded church when on descending from the pulpit he was arrested by an alguazil of the inquisition dragged through the crowd like a heresiarch attempting escape thrown into a coach and carried to the aljaferia there he was placed on a bench like a criminal interrogated as one and then without being listened to was sentenced to perpetual deprivation of the honors of the inquisition such as preaching at autos the edicts etc and reprimanded with the utmost severity the mark of infamy thus inflicted was indelible and the scandal was immense the people flocked in crowds to the viceroy in the greatest excitement and he had much ado to quiet them by promising that it should be remedied vinegas applied for the reinstatement of his honor to the council of aragon which replied that it had no jurisdiction then he applied to the suprema who refused to hear him he sent a memorial to the king who referred it to the council of aragon and he continued his efforts for more than a year but it does not appear that he ever obtained relief as a rule any criticism of the justice of the inquisition and any complaint by one who had passed through its hands were offences to be punished with more or less severity to this however there was an exception in a case the singularity of which deserves mention perhaps the most distinguished franciscan theologian of his day was miguel de medina he fell under suspicion of lutheranism was arrested and tried and died during trial may first fifteen seventy eight in the secret prison of toledo after four years of detention another franciscan francisco ortiz espoused his cause so zealously that in a public sermon in 1576 he pronounced the trial to be unjust for it was the work of a conspiracy among his brothers frailes the arrest was a mortal sin as though it were saint jerome or saint augustine and the inquisitor general espinoza who had signed the warrant was in hell unless he had repented the inquisitors were ashamed 
and were seeking to avert the disgrace from themselves, when they ought to be punishing the perjury of those who had testified. This was flat blasphemy against the holy office, and it is not easy to understand why the daring friale escaped, when tried by the tribunal of Toledo, with a reprimand administered privately in the audience chamber and a prohibition to enter Madrid without permission, a sentence which is duly confirmed by the Suprema. We shall see hereafter that another Fray Francisco Ortiz, for a similar offense, did not escape so easily. These were the defenses thrown around the Inquisition to secure its effectiveness in its supreme function of maintaining religious unity, and these were the efforts which it made to secure the recognition of the supremacy to which it aspired. It was an institution suddenly introduced into an established ecclesiastical and secular hierarchy, which regarded the intruder with natural jealousy and dislike, and resented its manifest resolve to use its spiritual authority for their humiliation. Its arrogant self-assertion led it to frequent mistakes in which even its royal protectors could not justify it but it gradually won its way under the Habsburgs. The advent of the Bourbons brought into play a new theory as to the relations between church and state, and the civil authorities were able in time to vindicate their equality and independence. We shall have the opportunity of following this struggle, in which religion was in no way concerned, for the defense of the faith was a pretext under which the holy office sought to arrogate to itself control over a constantly widening area of secular affairs while claiming release from secular obligations end of book 2 chapter 2 part 2